Um, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, this lecture and to Swinburne University. My name is John Webb. Uh, I'm from the, the Centre for Transformative Innovation at Swinburne, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this talk. But before we start our sort of formal proceedings, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the traditional custodians of the land on which we've gathered, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I'd also pay my respects to all Aboriginal community elders, past and present, who have resided in this area and have been an integral part of the history of this region. And I'm also very pleased to mention that our speaker, Professor Anil Gupta, met with several members of the Wurundjeri Wurundjeri community this afternoon. Now let me give, say a few words about Professor Gupta. Oh, I'll just call him Anil. Anil is based in Ahmedabad, Gujarat, in the western side of India, at the Indian Institute of Management at Ahmedabad, one of India's top business schools. In academic terms, it's a very respectable address. But as well, He's particularly well known for being the founder of the Honey Bee Network, a network supporting grassroots innovators and traditional knowledge holders. And it's quite innovative. It's now 26, Six years. 26 years old, or young, as the, uh, you might better think about it. I first met Anil about eight years ago when I was working at Delhi, in Delhi at the Australian High Commission looking after education and science matters at the embassy. More recently, in March this year, just very recently, I was able to attend India's Festival of Innovation, held at the estate of the President of India in New Delhi, and where Anil's guiding hand was very much in evidence. The range and impact of the Honey Bee Network was a wonder to behold. But Anil is also not, so he's got this activist, but he's also an activist who thinks very seriously about what he does. He's also a deep thinker about innovation. Now this word has been widely used in Australia by politicians and others for over 20 years. You may think it's a new word in our political discourse, but it actually has been around for a while. But in Australia we still do not understand it and we are still not very good at it. But I'm sure that after this evening's program, all of us will have a deeper understanding of what innovation is and what, there, what possibilities there are for creative, frugal innovation. Sorry. His visit uh, to Swinburne this week is a collaboration, as you can see from the banners behind me, between the, my centre, da -da -da -da, over here, Transformative, Centre for Transformative Innovation, and the Centre for Design Innovation, uh, both based at Swinburne University of Technology. And as an institution, Swinburne does value highly innovation and seeks to nurture it in, many, in its many aspects. And our two centres are two expressions of that commitment to supporting uh, innovation. Now, briefly, the, the schedule for this evening will also include a question and answer session immediately after the lecture, which I have the honour to chair. I will attempt to repeat the questions posed so we can all engage with the discussion. As well, you will notice that the, um, uh, the, the whole event is being filmed, so be this will be available uh, online in some version, uh, I think, in the next few days. Um, at the end of the q and I'll ask my colleague, Kate Bissett-Johnson, from the Centre for Design Innovation, to provide the vote of thanks. Kate and her design students have worked with Anil and the Honeybee Network. She will then invite you to the refreshments in the foyer. And I've been sternly reminded to ask you about your mobile phones and um, yeah, noisy devices. If you could please put them on silent, except for those who wish to tweet about a wonderful experience they're going to be immersed in in the next few minutes. And there, my advice is hashtag frugal. Is that the hashtag? I think it's hashtag, it is. It's hashtag frugal, if you wish to use the hashtag. Um, I will now ask you to welcome Professor Anil Gupta uh, to the stage to, to present his lecture on Frugal Innovations for Fertilising Imagination, Lessons from the, honey, from the Grassroots in Innovators. Sorry, the angle. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, friends. 
the journey that I'm going to share and talk about today has taken a while, two and a half decades, but more than that, what has been most inspiring through the years has been the ability to get surprised almost every day by the insights that we learn from most unexpected quarters. So one of the lessons up front I must say very Can you? Is it better? No? Better? Yes. It's better now? Thank you. So one of the most interesting thing and insightful thing that has happened over the last few decades is that it has reinforced my faith in the possibility that one can learn from unexpected quarters, which essentially means that there are innovations happening almost everywhere. Then why aren't they so visible to us? And what holds us or prevents us from accessing them? One possible reason why we don't see them as often as we should and then we could is probably because we don't expect them, but also because many times the people who innovate don't know that they have done innovation they will not be able to announce it. Let me just see. Yeah. So I'm going to share first the drivers. What are the drivers which push people to solve problems in a way that uh, becomes very creative, very compassionate, very collaborative? And I have deliberately used Hindi words because I think in Hindi, my mind works that way, and I don't want to make um, mask that feeling. So there's the first word that I have put is samvedana. Now, as you will realize that how English language sometimes is inadequate because empathy is for others, but as you will see, the meaning of samvedana is some means equal. Vedana means pain. When I feel pain of someone else as intensely as that person feels it, it does not remain that person's pain, it becomes my pain. When Sajan Shilta, the creativity is born out of that internalization of somebody else's pain, it becomes Samvedana, Samvedan Shil innovation or Sajnatmatta. So empathy is the one of the first drivers in grassroots innovations that has inspired us because many times we believe that people do try innovations only to solve their own problem. That is not true. Large number of people solve problems that affect somebody else in the community. But they feel concerned about it. And they think they are capable about it. They are concerned, they are capable, they are curious, and they are creative. And that combination is wonderful in generating solutions. So second driver is of course sahasta, spontaneity. There is not, they don't make much ado about it. They, it's almost like matter of the fact. I'm a mechanic, I'm a blacksmith, I'm a carpenter, I'm a farmer, I'm a pastoralist, and there's something that I can do, let me try it out. So what if it doesn't work? One of the advantages of frugal innovation system is that when the cost of failure is low, the lesson is try. So by working on innovations that don't cost a great deal, I think our spirit of adventure expands. We tend to try things more. We should tend to try things more. So spontaneity gets reinforced. So spontaneity gets fertilized. Spontaneity gets enlarged. Saralta, simplicity. That is the crux of the matter. Uh, one of the paradoxes is that many times we believe that common people only solve common problems in a very simple manner, which is true. But even the complex problems can be solved in a simple manner. Some of the most interesting equations are very simple equations, actually. So the question is that, how does the simplicity come in? Probably because they materially, they are constrained. Knowledge-wise, they are enriched. So they maximize knowledge, minimize materials. That's a very simple rule. Makes sense. If you don't have too much of metal, don't have too much of material, you don't have welding machine, no very f uh, fine uh, quality, Obviously, then, you will try to economize on the resources which cost you a great deal and maximize the resources that you can enrich, which is your imagination, your mind. 
Saralta, then sampration is very important. Unlike communication where gap is inherent, in sampration, which is the ability to communicate exactly as you feel, there is no gap. That's the beauty of this word. It is understood that when two sides understand the matter exactly as it is, then only some pressure. Some means equal pressure means information exchange. So that is another attribute that the knowledge exchange often is quite precise in many ways when the innovations diffuse in the local economy. Sahyog, which is collaboration, that is another driver of grassroots innovations. A uh, lot of things, though, may be attributed to individuals, but there is no denying the fact that many of them have drawn upon collaboration of help from many other people at different stages of the value chain. So these are some of the drivers which led the network to come about. So what is the network? A nameless, faithless person comes in contact with the network, gets an identity. That's what we do. Someone who nobody knows has got the opportunity, as John just mentioned to you, in the Festival of Innovation, hosted by the Office of the President of India, we are able to take these innovators right there. So much so that 10 innovators actually stay for two weeks as the guest of President of India at his house, as a part of Innovation Scholar in Residence. So it is possible to give identity to people only on the strength of their ability to solve a persistent problem or what is sometimes called as wicked problem, problem that has remained unsolved for a long time. And as we all know, the opposite of innovation is inertia. One of the great privileges that many of us intellectuals have, that we have known problems and we have done nothing about them for a very long time. We can explain why we have not done it. We can build theories about why change doesn't happen so fast. And yet, the people who solve the problems don't use that privilege, don't use that luxury. They actually go about trying to solve it. So the inertia, how do we overcome inertia is one of the things that will come out in what I'm going to talk today. Every six months we walk. We walk in different parts of the country. We call it Shodh Yatra. Shodh means to explore, Yatra means to walk. And every summer, summer we go to the places which are hot, winter we go to the places which are cold. So what does it do? It helps us to come to the point directly. We don't have to explain why we should be listened to. People understand. If you're coming in 47, 48 degree centigrade temperature to a place to learn and share, you must be crazy. And it makes sense because we are looking for crazy people actually. Honeybee Network is a network of oddballs. So unless you do crazy things, you wouldn't find crazy people. And we have enjoyed that. We have enjoyed that because the hospitality and the warmth that we receive. So also when I go back from here day after tomorrow, immediately after we'll be going to Maharashtra and Goa in the tribal villages from May 11th to 17th, we'll be walking in different villages. And the next walk in December will be Nagaland. And then we would have walked the entire country practically, all the states. And then again, next cycle will be. So the advantage of these walks is that we learn from four teachers. Teacher within, teacher around us, the peer, teacher in the nature, and teacher among the common people. Four teachers. I also have a course at IIA called the Shodhyatra course, which is where I take my students to Himalaya. And no books are allowed. People have to come empty mind. Books are banned in this course because there's so much else to learn from. They can do other courses where they want to learn from the books. So one thought which has come since morning several times, isn't frugality itself a driver of innovation? Because we have to be frugal, can you be frugal without being innovative? This thought came several times since morning in our discussions with different colleagues. And I think there is a merit in it. John Fisergald mentioned this, Jaffa mentioned this, many colleagues mentioned this. On independent, they have thought about it on their own, that to be frugal, to be economical, you, must, you have to be quite creative, because to be wasteful is easy. It doesn't require great imagination. The whole market, and there was a colleague here who was telling me how her branding strategies told people to buy things that they didn't need them. And now, this, with this kind of bias, where is the attempt, where is the imagination required to waste? But imagination is certainly required not to waste. 
So look at this. This is an example, very famous Akman, Mansukh Bhai Prajapati, who made this mitti cool fridge, uh, a double walled structure with water inside so that it evaporates and does the cooling for the thing inside, no external energy required, evaporative cooling is one enough, and various kinds of things. And there are this is, these uh, cooking pans, one and a half dollar cooking pans, non-stick pans. So when you use the synthetic pans, synthetically, I mean, Teflon coated pan, pans in which you cook food, after a while, the Teflon has gone away. And where has it gone away? The surface shows metallic, metallic beneath the, the coating. And it has gone to our stomach and it was not supposed to be eaten actually, we have eaten it. So naturally, consequences will follow for health. In this case, because it's a clay material, there are pores, the paint goes in the clay. So you don't get anything to scratch away. So it is safer, it is less costly, but very cheap compared to the $25 or $30 cooking pan. It is healthier because it is not letting it to be scraped off. So you are really getting more out of less, or as Dr. Mishilkar often says, more out of less for money, more out of less for more. We are getting more out of less. That is the mindset that we should try to use as few material resources, which obviously are the responsible cause for entropy. And entropy is the one which drives all the disorders. So these are frugal because of the good science and technology that they are using. A very interesting happened, thing happened when we were looking at this efficiency of this fridge. A scientific chemist from NCL came and said, how about painting the inside wall of this fridge with titanium dioxide nanochemical paint? So that the food will be preserved not merely because of the low temperature, which is not too low, but low, but also because the surface is antibiotic. Good idea. Now you can see how the science on the edge can be blended with the grassroots innovation to make them even more efficient. So please don't get the feeling that people, common people can solve all problems very easily on their own. No, they need us. They need for scientists. They need technologists. And technologists need them as well. Technologists will learn about frugal heuristics of frugal thinking. And the grassroots innovators will learn about new science and technology means, which make their, efficient, their solutions more efficient. There are four kinds of capital which are required for frugal innovation. Natural capital, social capital, ethical capital, and intellectual capital. The intellectual property, the patents, are a very small part of intellectual capital. So let me focus for a minute on social and ethical capital. Natural capital, you know, you know, when the property rights emerged, I started excluding others from the territories or from the resources, from fishing grounds, from forests, from grazing lands, from land or cultivation land, whatever. The commoditization of resources started and natural capital came into being. And to some extent then, it growth took place through social capital, which requires trust, reciprocity, and third party sanction. This is the, price, the fine distinction between social capital and ethical capital. In social capital, it is somebody else who can sanction my behavior if I am violating the group norms. So if you have a gill net to catch fish, and the community had decided nobody will use the gill net of less than four inches mesh size, and if you are found using it, your net can be confiscated, you can be given a punishment, you can be outcasted or whatever. That is the social capital, where group is monitoring the behavior of individuals, and it can sanction, punish. The ethical capital, on the contrary, is when you are monitoring the conduct from within. The spawning period, for the fish, same example if we take, you're not supposed to catch fish during the spawning period. Almost around the world, there's a taboo. Nobody will punish you if you did. Fish are actually very slow. They move slowly during the spawning period. They're easier to catch. And they realize that when things are easier to do, social sanctions don't work much. It is the internal sanctions, internal punishment that you give to yourself for that is what is most important. So ethical capital to me is one of the neglected but extremely powerful driver of innovation ecosystems. Intellectual capital, of course, is knowledge of this all. 
to give you an illustration how in honeybee network we have used ethical capital for saving tremendous amount of millions of dollars worth of financial capital so we filed patents and we have filed, filed about 800 patents few dozens have been granted it takes longer time in india several of them have been granted in us for the people who are not educated beyond 10th class so a lot of firms collaborate with us both in boston for our filing in us and for filing in india copyright trademarks plant variety protection all of them our average cost is about 300 dollars as against 3000 dollars for indian filing and no cost for international filing so if you calculate the cost which we have not paid you can imagine how much of money have we saved similarly we work with about 200 labs every year for validation of knowledge of people ideas of people innovations of people which we need to give awards for or give them risk capital to convert them into ventures so we should know that this idea will work otherwise there is no point in investing in it the scientists don't charge for the time so we can do in about 2500 dollars what will need 20 dollars 20000 dollars 25000 dollars so there's an enormous saving for the network and for national innovation foundation and trustee because lot of people not one or two hundreds of people hundreds of scientists hundreds of designers hundreds of patent lawyers are willing to work at practically no extra cost except the cost of filing and the fees and some documentation so this is one area where ethical capital can can be harnessed to promote collaboration to promote to promote collaboration which then becomes a means of being frugal so frugal innovations need frugal institutional design frugal ways of working frugal ways of doing your things so when we designed micro venture innovation fund mvif the idea was brought up in the discussion at first international conference on creativity and innovation at drasut at iim ahmedabad in uh, january 2000 in january 1997 it took some time to institutionalize it by 2003 it got institutionalized with the help of sidbi small scale industries development bank of india what did we do we realized that there was a lot of knowledge and awareness about microfinance but there was not any discussion about micro venture finance if innovation needs risk capital then small innovation needs risk capital too a student ideas also need risk capital and we decided that we will provide this finance to the innovators under single signature no co-obligant and no collateral now it's against the banking tradition you know normally don't no bank will fund any individual for any kind of investment under single signature and that too without collateral without co-obligant at least somebody else will have to guarantee your loan we said no your innovation you have shared your innovation you have shown trust in us it's our duty to show trust in you completed trust based economy and more than 80% money came back out of about a million dollar that we invested 5 crores more than 80% came back now it has been expanded so what i'm saying is that ethical capital also influences the financial capital it influences the all other capitals that have come about uh, let me now come to some of the conceptual framework in which we analyze the experience that we had first i will talk talk about how the formal sector corporate sector let us say interacts with the grassroots innovations or with the knowledge from the ground from the outside so there are two dimensions to this matrix inside out and outside in if you have lot of knowledge and you share it openly with outside then you have high inside out a firm which has produced some technologies that of course are useful for it but it doesn't mind sharing with other fellow entrepreneurs and fellow uh small companies or big companies then it will have high inside out when you want to get ideas from outside learn from people either through crowd sourcing or other means you have high need of outside in now let's look at the four combinations so you have the one which has both low doesn't want to learn from outside doesn't want to share from with outside that is an ostrich like behavior wouldn't go very far these companies are doomed we have seen how many companies 20 years ago were ruling the market today nobody knows about them they refused to learn from outside they refused to share what they knew with others 
That was one of the common reason why many of these companies failed. All right, so what do you do here? These are the companies which have very high need for outside in, a lot of crowdsourcing platform. Very many companies today have a crowdsourcing platform. But we don't tell you what they did with that. They think if we have paid you $10,000 or $50,000 for whatever idea we took, that's enough. They may have made $200 million or they may not have made anything, we don't tell you. So your self-respect doesn't go up. I'm not saying you pay more. Whatever contract is fine. But at least tell the people what did you do with it. How useful it was so that I treat my own ideas with greater respect. You don't lose anything if my self-respect goes up, but that feedback will not be given. So that is the problem with this model. Here, these are people, companies, leaders, innovation champions who share a lot with outside. Don't need much from us, inside, from others. They share with others. Tesla opened all its patents. I'm sure many of you know the story of Tesla. A company, electrical car company, pioneer in the world, a leader in the battery technologies. It shared all its patents because it wanted more companies to manufacture car because charging stations wouldn't be set up only for itself. Good idea. Can you imagine an entrepreneur saying, look, I want more competition because then I can be more efficient and more innovative and it will also help me to get common goods, common services like charging stations more and more so more people will buy. Whichever is good, they will decide. And this is where Honeybee Network is. DB, DB, Dil Bada, Dimag Bada, Big Heart and Big Mind. The companies, the corporations, the communities, the networks, the individuals who have a big heart and a big mind will not hesitate in sharing what they know and will not hesitate in acknowledging what they learn from others. One of the reasons Honeybee Network started was that we found that even the well-meaning intellectuals, and I was one of them, collect a lot of knowledge from people. We collect a whole range of data, analyze it, write papers, publish it, become famous, get consultancies, get a lot of money, become rich. Nothing ever goes back to the people whose knowledge made that richness possible. Isn't it true? And I thought I was no different from other exploiters I was writing about, whether in land market, commodity market, trading, lending, money, financial markets, wherever. I was exploiting in knowledge market, they were exploiting in their markets. What was the difference? So that desire to transform an exploiter into an exchange-based, sharing-based individual and uh, network, that's what transformation Honeybee Network has brought about. And now we are trying whether we can have a strong Honeybee Network in Australia and similar thing that we have done in India could happen. Now let me go to the next conceptual layer of this network. We came across this tree in Himalayan region and this tree started talking to me and it said, Do you know what happened? I said, what happened? He said, I was not supposed to branch, but I did branch. Then I said, my God, what have I done? There's a mistake. So that branch became a parallel stem. As I'm talking to you, many cells in my body are going through mutation. Thank God they are not cancerous, so I can continue to talk to you. Why? What is the process which is making it happen? That is called autopoiesis. My ability of my body to heal as errors happen, it, they are repaired, they are rejected, they are bypassed. All that process that happens is simultaneous, instantaneous, and it happens all the time. So systems which can repair themselves, redesign themselves, govern themselves, correct themselves are autopoietic systems. I'm not necessarily saying that they are the best system, but they are very powerful, they're very important. So let us see how we can go towards an autopoietic system. So there are three steps that we will take before we reach the autopoietic system and its limitations we'll study. First, well, let us see what kind of innovations, what, kind, what are the framework in which we can look at taxonomy of the innovation. I'll show you many examples, but before that, a framework will be helpful to see what these examples are for. So you have two dimensions here, assurances and capacity. Assurance can be high-low, capacity can be high-low. So if you have both are very high, there's a great degree of confidence that I have that this problem can be solved, and I have a great degree of competence, capacity, that I have the skills to solve the problem, I will transform the need. 
I will not solve what you're telling me. I will transform it to a next layer. Because I know after that you will ask another question and then another question. Why don't I go take you there? So there is a quantum jump that takes place. I take you through those steps and rather than being gradual or incremental, I go for radical innovation or disruptive innovation. So that requires both to be high assurance and capacity. If assurance is low and capacity is uh, both are low, you just bridge the need gap. It's like a, taking a, uh, a tape, there's a paper small torn, you just put the tape on that. You fix the problem wherever it is to the limited extent that it is. Don't care about how the consequences of that problem will be in future, what are the second generation, third generation problems that are going to arise. You don't worry about that. Just a quick fix solution. Bridge, bridge the gap. If the capacity is high and assurance is low, you try to eliminate for the present. Sometimes we do terrible mistakes here. So you say people are hungry, give them food. Eliminate the need without building their capacity, without building, giving them hope about what they will do in future. So, you know, I mean, at least I have studied, I have lived in some of the Aboriginal communities in the U.S. I know high, is, high incidence of diabetes, a very high suicide rate is what the consequence of welfare system has been for them. It has not generated entrepreneurship. Of course, casinos are there in some places. That's not entrepreneurship. But other than that, one has not built upon their knowledge system. So eliminating need in the short term doesn't go very far. Transformation, need enhancement. If you have a high assurance, low capacity, we can enhance the need so that we can say, okay, I don't know much about how to solve this, but we'll work together and find out a solution and take it forward. Let's look at second dimension of this framework. Knowledge asymmetry can be high or low. Knowledge asymmetry between formal sector and informal sector. So I'm a scientist, I'm a professor, and there's a community member, farmer, who doesn't know too much, or a small-scale entrepreneur, doesn't know too much. So asymmetry is high. And the synaptic interactions are high or low. Synaptic interactions are very important. Nowadays, even with my neighbor, I don't talk much. I talk through email or through other communications. We don't really have... It doesn't mean that if you're close to someone sitting nearby, you will have high interaction. In multi-story building, you don't know the name of the neighbor on the first floor, below, left and right. You may not visit them. 20 years, you may stay in that building, and you may not visit your neighbors, correct? So synaptic interaction is no proxy for... It doesn't indicate anything if it is low or high. It doesn't tell you how close or far you are from the people with whom you're working. So obviously, if both are low, you are insular. Don't care. Indifferent. If both... If the asymmetry is high, and interaction is low, you are an island. A professor who knows a great deal <laughs> doesn't share much with the students or the peers. He's an island. People respect him. That's okay. But doesn't fertilize the ground on which ideas have to grow. If the asymmetry is low but interactions are high, peer learning takes place. But it doesn't take us very high. It doesn't take us to a very high level of knowledge because the gap between my knowledge and the knowledge of others is not too high. So yes, I learn, but I don't make breakthroughs. If both are high, asymmetry is high, I know a great deal about something, you know a great deal about something, both are asymmetrical relationship. And we interact a lot, then inclusive innovation system can happen. Then I will include you not because you are good in what I am good at, you are good in something else which I am not good at. So I appreciate, I respect your expertise, you know the names and uses of, let us say, 200 plants. You can identify them just like this. And I can't write even name of 25 plants. I recognize your knowledge. But I'm very good in chemistry. I can tell you which are the pathways through which the reactions of the plant take place. I can tell you what is common between all the plants which are used for anti flatulence for example. You know, I can see the patterns. You cannot see them as easily, maybe. So there are strengths that I have, there are strengths that you have, if we include both strengths, and we don't become arrogant that my strength is superior to your strength, both are important, then the inclusive knowledge system can take place. Let's go to the next level. One of my PhD students, she's finishing her thesis in Amica. I have, this work has come out of her thesis. Uh, she was looking at climate resilience and how the creativity helps in climate resilience at the community level. 
So you have degree of self-governance on one side and degree of openness on the other side. So we, are, we began with open innovation, now we are moving towards, we are taking degrees of openness, so you can have high or low or high or low. If self-governance is high and degree of openness is low, autopoiesic system works well. A self-contained unit, a self-community which is satisfied by itself. A lot of indigenous communities are highly autopoietic in nature. They don't interact, they don't need much from outside. And therefore, in our language, they are not much developed. They haven't transformed their levels of economic living much, a great deal. But then their needs are also scaled down according to what they do. Heteropoietic systems are when both are low. I'm willing to, I know my knowledge, you have your knowledge, we'll work together. Co-creation is one when degree of openness is high and degree of self-governance is low. I acknowledge your point. I said, look, I don't know really how well we can solve this, but let us work together. And if both are high, you are open to learn from anywhere. Crowdsourcing takes place. You can go and talk to anybody. You share your problems very openly, no hesitation. You announce it to the world that, look, this is a problem I'm facing. Can you help me solve? And anybody can come forward and help you solve. Open source software came about through both being high, self-governance being high, and the sign of interactions being high. That is the root of why Linux movement became stronger and to some extent why Honeybee Network has survived so long and why our president, three last presidents, all the three have given us so much of support and accommodation in their scheme of things. So this helps, this helps. Now let me take you some practical examples. All of you have refrigerator at your home. And you know that refrigerator has a part which makes, produces heat the compressor. Do you know of any company which uses this heat? There is no company. There is no company in the world which uses the heat produced by the compressor of the refrigerator, right? So this heat is going waste. So what do you do? What this boy did? He put a heat exchanger alongside the compressor, took the heat, put a hot chamber on the top. So now you have a fridge which keeps things cool but also keeps things warm. And when you take the heat away, the compressor works less. When compressor works less, it consumes less electricity, about 18% less electricity. So you are using less energy and you are getting more out, more work. That is what I call as Indian model of frugal innovation. More out of less. You see the point? Extremely scientific, very clear science, no doubt about it, no ambiguity about it. It works. The question is, this is not something that only we can do or any, uh, one or two or five people can do. Everybody in the world should do that actually. That's what I'm arguing, because we have no energy to waste. Let me give you another example. Can you, we all have gas in our kitchen, and we cook food. And we know that flue gases go into the atmosphere and lead to all problems of global warming and whatever have you. This lady in Mizoram and Meghalaya, with several places, she says, OK, the heat is going up. Here, one shelf, I will put the wood which has to be cured. You know, wood becomes stronger when it is heated. So they make trolleys out of this wood. In the mountainous region, they use trolleys. And mind you, what is happening here? Those of you who are from physics background and chemistry would know that the temperature gradients are there, you know? So what the functional utility of temperature gradient is what she has done. For different temperature gradients, she has found different uses. Here, fuel wood, Chirapunji, the region which receives highest rainfall in Meghalaya. Meat, cheese, which have to be stored, dried up, you need little, much less heat, smoke, a little bit of smoke, and that gives you smoked cheese or heat. And on the top, there's a bag of seed on which, which is fumigated, no pest. Four layers of energy harnessing in a vertical column beyond the cooking stove. Tell me one kitchen in the world which does this. You have waste vegetables, you have fruits, you want to, they are not worth eating now. If you had these layers of heat gradients, you could have different shelves. So the design of kitchen, if there are friends from architecture here, they will appreciate that. The designs of kitchen will change forever if you decide to do that. And savings of the, the waste, bio waste will not become waste because we will be able to dry them and use them as snacks, dried Vegetable, dried tomato, I mean, leaf, slices of tomatoes, slices of gourd, slices of different vegetables, if dried, and then later on you can fry them. They are very good snacks. 
You are healthier. You are frugal. You are saving energy. It's costing less. And environment is good. We are good. Everybody is good. Another example. We were in this village, Nogliat, in Meghalaya. And the people in that village wanted to build a bridge across the river. They asked a question. We want to make a bridge, but not like the others. So first culprit was culture. Culture which created a question, I have to do something different. Something different. But how will we do that? So they began looking around and they found that there were rubber trees on both sides of the river. These roots were hanging. They looked like rope. Okay, we can use the roots. We can tie them and put the stones around them. So technology was there. But then the question is, one person cannot do it. You need group action. So you need institutions. So technology is like word. Institutions are like grammar. And culture is like thesaurus. We need all the three for a sustainable, frugal innovation and ecosystem. This is an example which shows that how innovations can be sustainable. But I want to caution here. Not all frugal innovations are sustainable. Though, more sustainable innovations must be frugal. Let me give you an example. It's a grassroots innovation, completely unsustainable. People use dynamite to catch fish. Right? I don't know whether in Australia people do that or not. But many parts of the world people do that. Very destructive. It kills small fish and big fish all the like. Right? It saves time. It costs less. But it is absolutely non-sustainable. So please, I let me not give you the impression that frugality invariably leads to sustainability. Generally it does, but not always. So we should be cautious and use metrics which is very, with a great degree of granularity so that we don't overgeneralize. This is an example, my favorite example, of how the excellence in society is promoted. And we found very, this example very inspiring. In this village in Bengal, there were some terracotta horses lying under a tree. So we were in one of our walks, Shodhyatra. So by the time we talked to the villagers, they gathered. Porters also realized that uh, I'm a professor. So I asked them, why do you keep such beautiful terracotta horses under a tree? Somebody can break it, somebody can take it. They said, Professor, you have done a mistake. I said, what happened? We haven't kept the most beautiful ones. We have kept the best ones. Why do you keep the best creation of yours under a tree? So that when our children walk by this street, they know what the current standard of the best is. They must do better. What a great principle of building communities and societies. If our students recognize this and realize that, look, whatever we could do, we have done. These are the, this is what best we could do, but you have to do better than us. Then the society is in an upward spiral and it will evolve instead of uh, good. This is an example how networks are sustained in the communities because networks of innovators, networks of communities, networks of knowledge are very critical. Whether you want to become an entrepreneur, you want to become a social innovator. So this is a particular practice in Sikkim where on a particular day in a year you have to collect nine sprouted grains from nine different neighbors. So let us say you go to the neighbor number one, number two, number three, and all the three give you the same grain. Because they didn't know who's going to sprout which one. You have to go to nine more. You have to collect nine different grains. So you service your network once a year and say hello and find out things and share and learn. And you know the society gets fertilized. The network gets fertilized. Let me go into the issue now. What do, how do we learn from grassroots innovations? What are the levels at which learning can take place? This is an example where a windmill was used to pump water with the help of a hand pump. So Mehtar Hussain and Mushtaq Ahmed, two brothers in Assam, had a, a small windmill, a, a very crude windmill to pump water for irrigating a paddy field. There's nothing new in windmill. It's an age-old technology. What is new is the question that they ask, which we don't ask. First question they asked is, and we brought this innovation to Gujarat for making salt. This is the new one. The first question they asked is, does it matter whether the paddy field is irrigated in four hours or 40 hours? Answer was, it doesn't matter. In fact, if anything, 
irrigation in 40 hours is better than four hours because less leaching of nutrients will take place. Slow irrigation is better. But plants need moisture, not water. Those of you who are plant scientists would know that. So there's no need to use a 50 horsepower or 100 horsepower motor and you know irrigate the whole field in one hour, two hours. It doesn't help. It may save your time, as you, as you, which you believe, but it costs a great deal because more nutrients have to be used. Soil is not able to breathe that well when there's inundation. No? So it, breathing is affected. Respiration is affected. The metabolization of the mineralization is affected. The transportation of the nutrients from the soil to the plant fruit is affected. All of that is affected. Second question they asked, does it matter because they were using hand pumps, so water comes in spurts, does it matter whether water comes in spurts or smoothly, how does it matter to plot? So they didn't use a gearbox. Gearbox is the most costly part and most difficult to maintain. Now, how do we find, what do we learn? So there are two heuristics which come out of this windmill example. Maximizing output per unit of time is not always good. I mean, drip irrigation came because of that. Most of the time may be good, sometimes it's not. So at least counterintuitive in heuristic should remain in mind. Is this a case where I should maximize the output per unit of time? Is this a case where smoother flow is better than the irregular flow? Will turbulence be of great advantage or disadvantage to me? And if it is advantage, why do I use fluid dynamics, all the equations, and then try to make this smooth flow with no added advantage? I have a habit as a hydrodynamics person, I know a great deal about fluid dynamics, I apply all those equations, I make the system very efficient, not knowing that all this was not required actually, it doesn't add value to the throughput of the reaction that I'm going to have in my, flour, in my boiler or whatever system that I have. So many times the frugality is avoided not because we know less, because we know a lot more. Our knowledge becomes the constraint, too much of knowledge becomes a constraint. It prevents us to think simply. So there are four levels at which we can learn from innovation. Artifactual level, windmill to windmill. We brought the windmill from Gujarat, from Assam to Gujarat, east to west, without a gearbox, and it worked well. That is artifactual. Metaphorical or analogic. We use innovation as a metaphor. So we know a large number of examples where metaphors have led to powerful innovations. The Velcro is a very famous example. There are a large number of examples. The, uh, the surfaces which repel the water, you know, like lotus leaf, for cleaning, self-cleaning surfaces. A lot of good, a lot of research is, or a lot of good physics is being done on self-cleaning surfaces. Heuristics. What are the thumb rules that we use from get from the innovation? and just start, what is the ecosystem that made that innovation possible. So we need to draw, as you can see, as we go down the list, we are getting, becoming more abstract. The more abstract we are, the more widely we can apply that principle or that ecosystem. So grassroots innovations are not just to be dismissed because the solution, particular solution doesn't help me. To give you an example, in a village we were walking and we, we, start, we, did for, we, talk, we were talking about herbal pesticides. After talking for about half an hour, a farmer said, Professor Gupta, I understood what you're saying. I said, what am I saying? You are saying that all the plants which animals don't eat are the source of potential herbal pesticide. I didn't say that at all. I was giving examples of different plants. He saw the pattern. He made this principle. All the plants which animals don't eat, so what do I need for killing pest? Toxicity. Why do I need to buy the toxic chemicals from the factory? They're in the backyard. Every part of the world has plants which animals don't eat. Tephrosia, for example, in the rangelands, you will find tephrosia species, many other species which animals don't graze on them. These are the useful sources for herbal pesticide. Simple. Universally applicable heuristic. Frugal solution. Democratic, open. There are 10,000 such examples on our website. Available to anybody to download, open, access them. Sashti.org. So, grassroots innovations can be knowledge and innovations that emerge from grassroots. These can be, which can be developed at grassroots, for grassroots, and with grassroots. We should distinguish these. There's, it's useful to know there are four different ways in which innovations emerge or in, innovations evolve, and we should not mix up these categories because then the 
theory building will suffer and also uh, we will not be able to build upon, upon each other's ideas. If you want to work with communities and you want to work in your lab and then give those solutions to them, then you, it is innovation for grassroots. You're not working with them, you're not working at community level, you're working in your lab, but you're doing something meaningful, but that's different, that is different. Let us not use a category which is diffuse because then accumulation of knowledge suffers. Then we are not able to build upon each other's ideas and works better. How do we take disruption? How do we look at it? This is one database that we have, techpedia.in or techpedia.sashi.org. We have about 190,000 engineering projects, either summaries or title, from more than 600 institutions, 550,000 students in India mapped up. What is the advantage? The advantage is that no student of our country should do what has been done before. No country, no student in Australia should do what has been done before. But how would the student know what has been done in Deakins? I went there yesterday. I asked them this question. Do you have a database of all the projects? I'll ask the same question to you. Do you have a database of all the projects that students have done over the years? Undergraduate and postgraduate? What are we saying? And these projects are normally not published. So they are great literature. So if a student comes out with the same idea for two years or three years and I have forgotten about it, or in another department the fellow is doing it, isn't it a criminal waste? Every life is precious. How can a precious human life be invested on solving a problem that has been solved already? Doesn't make sense, isn't it? So I hope that those students who are sitting here will take initiative. Tomorrow, before I leave, you should try to pull all the abstracts, at least abstracts, I'm not saying full projects, abstracts, title of the project, name of the guy, name of the student, email contact, tags, and the abstract. Let there be a global platform where we pool all the projects done by the students everywhere. What will happen? You will start seeing patterns. You will start seeing building partnerships. You will start collaborating. The boundaries of departments, boundaries of walls, of very, very small disciplinary boundaries will go away. <laughs> and they have to go away anyway. We have made the beginning in India already. Since 2009, we have the IITs, and IITs, and this is open. You can just, if you're on a phone, just open techpedia.in, you will open it, write any word there. In fact, I could just show you one, a simple uh, search here. Uh, is it a Mozilla? So I'm not here, now let me write down, let's say we are interested in solar technology. We want to know who is doing what in solar. So I have projects here. Uh, I've got solar operated car, I've got rotating solar collector, steam generated, I've got uh, Pathfinder robotic rover which is using solar energy, uh, solar water heaters, uh, microprocessor based solar concentrator using DC motors, what so, what so, what so, so on and so on and so forth. And you can go on and on and on. And you can find out who has done an Aitikhar Kanpur zinc oxide mediated solar photocatalytic degradation of metal complex, etc., etc., etc. How much time it took? 2,563 projects done by Indian young minds are available to you for reference at no cost. Does it? mean any loss to you? Will it improve the quality of research or decrease the quality of research? It will improve the quality of research, I hope. And we don't care whether you reciprocate or not. If Sinbon University decides to reciprocate, we'll welcome it. But if they don't, even then it will be available to you. So it is open access, not contingent on any condition of reciprocity. That's the beauty of the great knowledge systems, they grow without expectation. Eventually reciprocity arises. That is our experience. Eventually. One day everybody will realize that it helps to share because then we can build upon each other's ideas. So this is, uh, you can all try in your areas, chemical, whatever areas that we have. And, uh, okay. How much time do you have? Seven minutes, okay. So let me quickly go through this. So this is a boiler with system she designed and it is very interesting. Within one year he crossed uh, more than 100,000 to begin with and then 
10 million in a year. I've never seen such fast growing innovation. Why? Because what he did was, he created a system of boiler where he used the waste steam and recycled that steam. So next time, steam which was at a, let's say 100 degree or 120 degree was brought to 75, then from 75 to 120 it takes less heat. And that's the cycle he built and saved 60% energy compared to the other boilers that are used. 60% saving in energy. Everybody who heard about it and he was showcased it, you saw that. The first innovation on the right in the exhibition was this one. And great idea, great idea. There is a Pocham Palisari, those of our Indian friends sitting here know that this is one of the most complex weaving technology because it is doubly cut. That means if you imagine a, a, a pixel board of computer and there is a weft and there is a warp, every pixel on the warp and every pixel on the weft must coincide to produce the same design on the upper side and the lower side of the sari. That's the point. So it's a very complex technology, hugely complex. The dyeing has to be very accurate, weaving has to be very accurate so that the green on the top and green on the bottom will meet together and only up to that point that the particular geometrical design has to be formed. One of the most intricate technology of weaving. So his mother used, Mereshyam's mother used to do this 9,000 times for one sari in a day she could do twice, 18,000 times. Her hand used to get tired. She said, Velasham, try to find some other job. I can't do it anymore. He said, I don't know anything else. A tenth pass person learned programming, learned fabrication, learned control systems, and designed a machine, this one, which is programmable. And he can design according to the design that you have, how many uh, rounds you want on each peg can be controlled. And this is the pre dying process. After this you will do tie and dye and then you will do weaving. That is the way it is. A multi-purpose motorcycle based structure. Many of vineyards in Australia have compact soil so quality of grapes is not that good so wine can be better if you have a light machinery which will not compact the soil. But there are no light machineries here. We have. You could try them. We are already taking them to Kenya and some other countries. Uh, very low cost. So there are different ways in which inclusive systems evolve. The bypass regions are, are, in, are the problems of bypass regions or spaces are looked at, bypass sectors are looked at, handloom is one of the sectors which is bypassed. There's hardly much innovation that formal sector has given to the handloom sector. The social segments which are bypassed, the skills which are bypassed, seasons. So there are also innovations by the students, uh, we have a database called, as, as I told you, Techpedia, which is an engineering student database. We have similarly grassroots innovation database, shashti.org or anib.org. Here we give award to students every year at the Festival of Innovation, Gandhian Young Technological Innovation Award. So these uh, two students thought of a very interesting idea. They said that if the deaf girls or boys want to dance, they can see the action, but they can't get the, they can't hear the beat. So they designed two rings which will give vibration as a cue, as per the music beat. So you can now dance exactly as you need to, as if you're listening to. Beautiful idea, beautiful idea. We liked it very much. It was an example of an inclusive innovation designed by students, got an award. Similarly, when people have Alzheimer, their hand shakes a lot. Now, this is a system which neutralizes the uh, shaking action to the tip of the spoon so that the things in the spoon will not fall down, even though your hand will shake. So it's, uh, dissipates that shaking action. Okay, another example. We also work with children, a lot of innovations by children. So for example, one girl sent an idea. Uh, there are walkers, many of you must have seen these walkers. But these walkers can't be used on the stairs, even in Australia for the matter. With best of the science and technology, we don't have a walker which can be used on the stairs. So this girl thought that her grandfather couldn't use the walker for the stairs. She sent an idea. Our team at NIF, National Innovation Foundation, fabricated it. This is the walker. Our student at IMA was using. The lady can be used. Front legs can become taller or shorter. Technology was licensed to a company, Avira Technologies. A few lakh rupees went to her as a license fee. She gets a few hundred rupees on every sale. She's one of the youngest entrepreneurs of our country. She gets, innovation. She gets 
income because her idea has been converted into product and product into business. Uh, this is very interesting. Many of you are aware of the Internet of Things. And my problem is that why do you always want to create more and more inanimate things? I'm a thinking person. I'm a feeling fellow. I think. I feel. So what about Internet of Thoughts? Internet of Feelings. Internet of Pets, People and Plants. So if pets are, pro if what, this idea was triggered by this girl who get an idea, sent an idea that, look, when sometimes pets are stressed, your cat and dog are stressed, you don't feel it, you're very busy, you don't talk to them, now the message comes, they're under stress, please go and spend some time with them. A jacket is, they're wearing a jacket or a belt, and the belt sends you the message. Internet of thoughts, internet of feelings, internet of beings, internet of pet, plant, and people. Why not? Elderly people can't really pick up a phone and dial, because my father, 88 years, he can't use a phone, but he needs to tell me if he needs me, and so I need to be able to connect to him. If he falls down, I should know immediately that he has fallen down, so those devices are available nowadays. So question now is that, can we move from things to thoughts, and where does this idea come from, from a school girl, not from a scientist? These are... Uh, a, a dot matrix printer converted into a, 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 a braille printing printer. What a great idea. A very low cost dot matrix printer are nowadays out of use. Nobody uses them anymore. But on the drum, you put a, on a cylinder, you put a rubber tube, take away the ribbon, and now you put a paper, thick paper, it will create embossing. So you invert the image that you have to print because dot, the braille must be done in the invert, so then you can read it properly. And boss will be negative. And those two boys made this innovation possible. We gave this problem to children in, a, in a, one of the workshops. Think of uses of cycle other than transportation of people and things. And came out so many ideas. I think sometimes we are not challenging ourselves or our children or our students much. As a teacher, you know, a good artisan does not blame his tools. As a teacher, I will say I can't blame the students. It is my inadequacy if I'm not challenging my students enough. And we need to challenge them more and more. A lot of ideas came in little time, uh, a thresher, a harvester, and whatnot. Uh, did you notice the blank slides? Why did I put the blank slides? Anybody? Any guess? Do you know? Yes, please. Maybe something came to your mind just to speak of it. Sorry? Yes, yes. And what do you think I want to hear? Can you guess? Information from us. Or... Ah, yet I want you to be here. This is space is for you. Not for me. Presentation is by me, but the space belongs to you. And it can only happen when you share your ideas with me. Will you? Yes or no? Yes, okay. So then in my presentation, you will have here, now look at this. Do you know who is he? Anybody quickly? How many of you know this person? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's it. You know what he did? David Junipion, what did he do? What is his great claim to fame? He's one of the great inventors of your country. I'm very inspired by him. I'm inspired because Australia is the only country which has put sketch of an inventor, that to an aboriginal inventor, on a $50 bill. No country has done it. I mean, my tribute to the people who thought about it. The Federal Bank of Australia and the leaders who thought about it. Such a great tribute. It makes a difference. It makes a difference. Unfortunately, not as many of you know about it. That's unfortunate, but I'm sure <laughs> that's a job we have to do better in communicating. You have used this dollar bill many times. You have made payments with this. You didn't care to look at that, but it's a great tribute. You know what he did? Among many inventions, one of the things that he did most was, yes, the sheep shearing devices. He invented many mechanical sheep shearing. And you know how critical wool is to Australian economy, so how much great contribution it is. It is not for nothing that you, in, you celebrate somebody like this. So in some sense, in some sense, Australia is ahead of us, in some sense we are ahead of Australia. When it comes to giving currency, literally, to an idea, 
you are ahead. When it comes to giving position and, and respect to them in the president of India's house, probably India has created a good model. And we can complement, we can learn from each other and build upon this model so that more and more people get credit and recognition. There is a, I will not go into detail, uh, there's a portfolio of incentives that are required to run the system and lubricate the system so that everybody works for mutual advantage in corporate, material incentives, material individual, material collective. In non-material individual, non-material collective, there are four kinds of sells a portfolio of all the four kinds of incentives will work. Unfortunately, many times when we devise incentive schemes, we, we pit, put too much emphasis on material, too much on money, and too little on non-monetary infection. But we all know that after a while, the monetary incentives don't attract as much uh, incentive attention as the non-monetary one. So, question is, can we connect the, com uh, the uh, society with different sectors? What do we do? How do we de generate? Uh, we should create, sense the unmet needs. In, we have been creating innovation clubs. You can create an innovation club here to do four things. Search innovation, spread innovation, celebrate innovation, invite inno innovators to the classroom. A student should invite. And fourth is sense the unmet needs. Unmet needs of the elderly people, unmet needs of our neighborhoods, unmet needs of the small entrepreneur, anybody. And that because small entrepreneurs generate most jobs, but they can't afford to do R&D. They don't have an R&D team. Who will do R&D for them? The students of, you know, uh, like say, present here, some of them, should be doing the R&D for them. So, uh, creativity counts, knowledge matters, innovations transform and incentives inspire, but not just the material incentive, also non-material incentives, and not just the individual incentives, but also the collective incentives. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Anil, for a, an inspiring presentation. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. Um, so, we, are there any questions that are really burning in people's minds? There is a microphone which will run up to you. Thank you very much for a very wonderful and inspiring uh, presentation. Uh, the obviously encouraging students to come up with innovative ideas is something which should be done in all countries. Uh, what I'm a little uh, not sure about is how many of these 190,000 ideas, which not, they are more than ideas, sorry, they, 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 they are working pieces, how many of them are commercializable and is there any incentive which you can think of for uh, the... Uh, uh, the necessary uh, uh, materials which you said which is required to make them usable by not just that community where it was uh, uh, invented or it was developed but across the board for all parts of India is there a, an appetite for investing in these sorts of ideas? I shared three kinds of innovations with you ideas of children, ideas of college students and the informal sector just to be able to clear that we cannot use the same set of incentives for different kinds of audiences. For the children, I gave you an example where we convert into product, licensed it to a company, and then that person is getting right. Because they must first finish their studies, so we don't want to really get them off these studies. For technology students, uh, we have awards. We have 15 scholarships of 15 lakh, roughly about, let's say, $2,500. Sorry, fifteen thousand dollars, twenty-two thousand dollars. I'm sorry, twenty-two thousand dollars for two years, and three thousand dollars to hundred students. This is a new scheme with the help of Department of Biotechnology and Shashti have joined hands. Virak Biotechnology Industry Research Council and Shashti have uh, joined hands to encourage students to move towards entrepreneurship but without any obligation. So we say, okay, you want to first perfect your product better? Okay, do, do that. In the process, we will connect you to some mentors, see whether you want to go for, forward. Some of them have received investments from Singapore and from some other places. One of my students, uh, when I went recently to Singapore, she took up five ideas, one of which was that if you have urinary tract infection, women have often this infection, men can also have, and Normally it takes about 72 hours to culture the 
uh, urine and then find out which organism has affected and then give the relevant antibiotic. This student from IIT Kharagpur has developed an antibiotic finder which in four hours tells you, Suman Kapoor and our students, tell you in four hours which antibiotic should be used. Isn't it a great advance? 72 hours versus four hours. And you start the treatment in the right direction. So there are some very good solutions of this kind which have come up. Uh, hunger in the corporate sector is low for these innovations. I will not deny that. Uh, hunger among the high net worth individuals to invest in heart technologies is also low. In the IT and all, no problem. But in heart technologies, they, not many people understand them enough. For informal sector, we have small innovation fund, venture fund which we invest. About 10% of the 800 patents have been commercialized, which is a reasonable number. In all the cases, benefits have gone back to the people, mostly to the small entrepreneurs, some to the small companies, none to the big companies as yet. Uh, but we are on this path. And we have MOU with Indian Council of Medical Research, Council of Scientific Industrial Research, Indian Council of Agricultural Research, so all the scientific bodies and I have his network with. And we're trying to see that the best of the formal and informal science work together. And mind you, our budget was very small, actually. $400,000 was the budget for 10 years per year. That was the interest on 5 million corpus with which we worked. So all this which has happened thanks to the voluntary spirit of the people that we could do so much. But, uh, and I don't mind that, but yes, you are right. Much more needs to happen. Much more needs to happen. Yes, another question just in the front here, please. One moment for the microphone. Oh, I have Thanks for your talk. Uh, excellent. Very inspiring. I, when I grew up in India, since this decades ago, and even till about 20 years ago, there was this word called appropriate technology. I was quite struck by the fact that you didn't use that word at all today, although you have said that all frugal inventions are not sustain may not be sustainable, but sustainable inventions of fruit should be frugal or whatever. But can you tell me how you are able to change the culture of thinking, for example, where you know it's not the ap appropriateness matters, but it is not just technology, but it is more than that. I also didn't use another word, yes. regard. <laughs> Deliberately so. Yes. Because I think these kind of language creates a cast of mind which leads to shortcut answers, short term answers, and no society can find a bright future for itself if it restricts or focuses too much on short term, quick fix solutions. That's a mindset I don't want to encourage at all. It has costed us a great deal. A lot of our creative energy was trapped in trivial ways of solving problems rather than systematic ways of solving those problems. So I gave examples where you could find that this doesn't happen by tinkering just on the way. You know, you have to apply your mind and get those solutions and it would have required a lot of effort. With limited knowledge that they had, they could make many iterations and then solve the problem. Sometimes it took, a, took them five years, 10 years, 15 years to solve a problem. So yes, it takes time. We are making some progress. The reason that Sinban University is taking interest in frugal innovation is very encouraging. And I hope that some of the labs that I have seen here, and Kate was with us last year, and she will be with us again, virtually at least, if not physically, in the summer school that we organized for the students, where she delivered a talk on uh, the designer, how can designers contribute by looking at the user needs and convert them into fine product. Design is a very weak spot of our Indian manufacturing in general. We don't finish things very well. There's a problem area in India. So we really look for great collaboration in that regard. It's taking time, but it's happening. It's happening. Perhaps one more question. Or oh, that comment is a very nice segue into asking Kate Bissett Johnson to come up and, uh, and give us a vote of thanks for Anil. Thank you. Thank you, uh, John. So my name's Kate. I lecture here at Swinburne into industrial design and product design engineering. Very happy to see some familiar faces and see some of my students actually came, so thank you for coming along. Uh, Professor Gupta, on behalf of Swinburne, I'd like to offer our thanks for you in coming to Melbourne. 
and particularly your gracious gift of time to staff and students. Also in anticipation of you coming into my classes tomorrow. So those guys that are here now and girls better be here tomorrow, well, in the classroom tomorrow. Um, we're um, very, very grateful to have one of the world's leading experts in the area of frugal innovation to share your ideas with us absolutely firsthand. And I hope we can continue to work together in this space and that perhaps in the future some of the student work from Swinburne, which we're sharing back to you at the Honeybee Network, can fill in some of those blank spaces on your slides. Um, I'd really like to thank the audience for coming along this evening. It's not always easy to come out after work or study, so I very much appreciate you coming. I'd also like to say uh, thanks to Mitchell Adams. I'm not sure where Mitchell's going. Oh, he's up, up here. Thank you very much, Mitchell, for the organisation of the event and also the support of the Centre for uh, Design Innovation and the Centre for Transformative Innovation in sponsoring this event. I now officially invite you to come and join us for drinks in the atrium space outside. And I'd like to have a round of applause for Anil, please. Thank you.